names, my man. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Jake, I am feeling awesome, brother. How are you doing today? I'm good. I feel like this, uh, this interview slash conversation is about two plus years overdue at this point. <laughs> Agreed. Absolutely. But at least it's finally taken place. That's right. That's right. Better late than never. So uh, while we uh, dive in for our listeners that are joining us today, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do now. Uh, and man, then we're going to dive into your just awesome journey. Awesome. It is an absolute pleasure to be on here. Uh, a little bit about myself. Currently, I am a man on a mission to be a student again in life. I think uh, all too often, we often drop the ball on wanting to learn. And as I reached 40 this year, I reached that, that fourth level in my life. Wow. I became literally on a mission to develop and learn again. I just had that, that yearning to learn. So I'm on a man on a mission, on a man on a mission to develop, uh, continuously make improvements and to purposely serve. And that's where we find, that's where we find me these days. I love that, man. And, and obviously, uh, home now in Austin, Texas. Yes, sir. And you've been all over. So uh, let's talk about, because you, you are all over, a lot of the listeners uh, listening to the show may recognize your name a little bit from Dubai in the uh, <laughs> fitness competition, now officially sanctioned CrossFit Games competition out there. Uh, but you've had quite the fitness journey from a coaching standpoint. Take us through a little bit of that. Where have you been? What kind of got you involved in that space and and then eventually what brought you down to Austin okay so I started in fitness about 16 years ago uh, prior to that I was in retail uh, I was selling cell phones and beepers even I went that far back uh, but I got into I got into fitness when I was about 20 years old and I absolutely fell in love with it it completely changed my body and I finally made the career change when I was 25 uh, so fast forward um, I got into it. I was working in corporate fitness and I was a fitness manager and really taking it from, uh, from more of a sales side of things than a fitness side of things. After years and years of corporate fitness and going down that route, I discovered CrossFit and I discovered it in a way that most fitness people do. Uh, I'm not going to do it. You're not going to make me do CrossFit. Uh, there's no way in hell I'm doing that thing. But I found it on YouTube. Uh, a buddy of mine came in, and he's like, you got to check this out. And sure enough, it was getting more and more popular. Uh, friends of mine, close friends of mine, and even close associates of mine were doing it more and more. So I decided to make an educated opinion on it. And I went down to a gym that I knew the owners. I had a lot of respect for these people that they had a background outside of, of CrossFit. And so I jumped into my first workout. and. I fell in love. I fell in love. I love the, it was more or less the environment than anything else. Yeah, the workouts were great, but I love the fact that I was the last person working. There were moms. There were people that were way older than me, finished, using more weight, doing all those things. And they were there cheering for me right side by side. And it was fantastic. And so that was in 2010. Uh, Right after that, I decided to become a member at that gym and just soak it all in as a member. I was still working in corporate fitness in, in Manhattan for a large corporate fitness chain uh, and under a lot of pressure, under a lot of pressure at that time. I decided to dive right in as much as I can in the CrossFit and really submerse myself into the community and learning as much as I could. Fast forward to Sandy the hurricane that hit New York. And I lived in Long Beach, New York at that time. And I also had a private boot camp. You can call it a boot camp. I was running and it was fantastic. I was working corporate fitness. I was doing my boot camp on the side and I was learning as much as I can about CrossFit uh, on my spare time. Sandy hit. That completely decimated my boot camp and the place that I was holding it at. I had to move. I was displaced. I had to move to Brooklyn to my father's house. So a lot changed. And I remember going to work. I was working in Manhattan. And I remember literally going to work. I had no clothes. I just had the clothes that I had with me. So I remember going into, going into the gym and going into the office and sitting there. And my, my, my manager, my regional manager comes out and he's like, hey, I heard what happened. Is everything okay? I'm the type of guy that's not going to complain and gonna start whining about what just happened i'm like yeah everything's okay you know 
I'm okay. I made it out. I didn't stay. A lot of my friends lost a lot of more than I lost. So, but I'm okay. And he's like, okay, that's good to hear. That's good to hear because I need to know how you're going to finish out the month. I need to know what is your plan to get you across the finish line, even though you're up against these challenges. And I looked at him and I said, you want me to sell personal training to most of our clients and our consumers are people that commute from New Jersey and Long Island. These people lost majority of their belongings. Some of them don't have homes. These are our clients. So you want me to come across the finish line. That's what you're concerned with right now. He's like, we got to do it. And I understand, you know, I get it. I understand. He's got a job to do. He's fully committed and focused to that. And I, but at that point, I said, there's a bigger game plan here. And that's not it. Why weren't we trying to think about the people, our clients? Why weren't we trying to think of them and how can we help them? How can we reach out to these people and say, hey, look, I understand, you know, you were doing personal training with X trainer. Is there something that we can do to help you? Are you okay? Right. But we weren't thinking about that. We were thinking about how can we get their money? And that's where I decided to do some soul searching and I went and I um, signed up for my L1 and I took a week off. I took a vacation that I had and I went to San Diego to do my L1 and out there it was life changing. Uh, of course, if you've ever taken your L1, it's a, just a truly great experience. A lot of fun. Um, but I met Dave Lipson. He was one of my L1 coaches. I met Cammy uh, and a couple of other coaches. But Dave and I hit it off pretty well. He's a New York guy. I was a New York guy. Uh, we also had people. Uh, we had connections there. So he's like, hey, listen, if you're going to be in town for a couple of days, come drop in to CrossFit Invictus. You know, anytime you want. I'm there this day. You know, come on in. We'd love to have you. Fantastic. So I took him up on the offer. And I went down. And I dropped in. And that was also a game changer for me. I got a chance to see what CrossFit was like in California, which is way further advanced than New York was at that time. Yeah. Also, if you've ever been to Invictus, it is one of the nicest gyms you'll ever see. I'm used to a corporate fitness gym, like the Equinoxes, the yeah. Sports Club of LA's. So at that time, my experience with CrossFit was like a, a garage gym. It's just what right. most of them were, yeah. Yeah, this is 2011, 2012. So I walk into Invictus, and it's this beautiful gym. And there's a front desk person, which you never really – you hardly saw at that time in CrossFit gyms, right? So I had – already I was in love. And there was a whole process on how to get me from, you know, uh, dropping in to get me into class. It was awesome. It was, it was really, uh, really eye-opening. I loved it. So I take Dave's class and he's a phenomenal coach. I loved his, his energy was, was just amazing. The class was fantastic. Afterwards, or well, during class in his icebreaker, he's like, Hey, it's taco Tuesday. We're going to taco Tuesday. Who's going to taco Tuesday. And I'm like, I, he's like, James, you're coming to taco Tuesday. I'm like, I guess so. I'm coming to taco Tuesday. Fast forward. Class is fantastic. Everything's great. Uh, he's like, yeah, you know, taco Tuesday. We're going to this place on gas lamp. You know, we'll go about like seven o'clock. All right, great. So I'm thinking it's a Invictus thing that's doing Taco Tuesday. I go home. I go to my hotel. I shower. I'm like, all right, you know, I draw up the courage and to go. I'm like, just go, dude. This is what you wanted. Go. I'm on the street. I see no one. I'm like, all right, 705, 710. Don't see anybody. All of a sudden, Dave and Cammy start walking up the block. And they're right, they're literally about to walk past me and Cammie notices me and she's like, hey. And she points at me and Dave looks at me and he's like, James, what's up, buddy? What are you doing here? And I'm like, it's Taco Tuesday. He was like, oh yeah, me and Cammie do Taco Tuesdays. And he's like, yeah, I was just saying what we were doing in class. And I'm like, oh dude, I just crashed. <laughs> Dave and Cammie's Taco Tuesday date. <laughs> so... Dave, being the amazing person that he was, is like, no, dude, come. Like, I'm like, no, dude, I'm not crashing your date. They weren't married at this, time, at this point. And I'm like, I'm not crashing your date. And he's like, no, dude, just come on, man. And so I, I, I go in and we sit down and we have a great conversation. And we're talking all things fitness. His journey, my journey, Cammy's journey, 
Um, and it was just a great experience, you know, to, to kind of sit with two people that were like immersed. They were kind of like crossroad royalty yeah. at that point. And they still are. And out of that, uh, later on, you know, we kept, uh, I, I sent them a message, thanked him through Cammy because Dave had no social media at that time. Yeah. Uh, and not many people did, but Dave was not on social media at all. But through Cammy, I sent him a message and I said, hey, if you can do this, pass this on to Dave. Thank him so much. I really appreciate it. And I, you know, I, I'm sorry for crashing your date. And so Dave writes me back and he's like, hey, dude, so awesome to meet you. Uh, I want you to reach out to this person. He's opening up a gym in New York and he can use someone like yourself. And sure enough, that led to the next step in my journey. And that led to my, my first true job in CrossFit. I love it. I love it, man. So uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about that because you built some amazing communities and just community and space in New York before eventually moving down into Texas. Yep. Take us just kind of a high level overview of, of what that was uh, and a little bit of that journey process because where, where I'm trying to go is, is you've made some posts recently in the last month or so online that I kind of want to dive into about creating a lot of success on the exterior that looks great and then personally you're dealing with some major battles. So yeah. we don't always know what people are going through. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit more about this success in fitness in New York. So I have already had at least 10 plus years, oh, that was my dog. I had 10 plus years of fitness background and managing large corporate gyms. But the thing that was missing to me was that community, that tribe feel and CrossFit had it. So my first experience was CrossFit Garden City and I loved it. And Dennis and Jen Marshall, they did a phenomenal job of showing me how to do that and showing me how to build a community. So when I started to do that in Manhattan, there was no community, there was no sense of community there wasn't people that welcomed you at all my experience with dave that also led to me believing that hey it's not about just it's not about me it's about the community and his whole point was the reason why i invited you down and like and I, we had dinner and we talked and i shared that with you because that's what this community is all about so just do me a favor just exude that yourself pay it forward the next time so I made that promise that I would. And building that community in New York was a challenge because New Yorkers are New Yorkers. But people were starving for it. People yeah. are, you know, people were coming from all over in New York. They're not, most New Yorkers don't, are not from New York, very much like Austin. People were starving for it. People needed a place to go. And I realized that people just wanted to make friends. People just wanted to be, be a part of something. So the workouts bled to that. The workouts, I decided to go away from a competitive focus where most gyms were focused on competitiveness and focus on using fitness as a vehicle to build those bonds and build those relationships. And every day it was most people are building, okay, how can we build these competitive athletes? Well, I was like, how can I build better humans? And it was like, we started with an icebreaker, just like I learned. Let's do an icebreaker. And every day I'd ask some weird question and get everyone around the room at 5.30 in the morning when they didn't want to do it and they would do it. But then that would, they would learn each other's names and they would learn to talk and they would laugh and it would break the ice. And then we'd go about a workout and I would put the basic rules. Look, you're not allowed to put your equipment away when other people are working out. If you're done, well, great. Go cheer them on. It was the small things and making sure that the small details mattered. I remember my first community event had two people, two people at the bar, two people showed up, but you know what? I, we had a blast and we talked about everything and sure enough, the next event had 10 people and the next event had 20 people. And I'll fast forward. The last event I did before moving on was the CMC civilian military combine. And no one knew what I was leaving. I had already made the decision to, that I was going to leave. I was going to put my notice in. No one knew. This was our last event together. And we showed up. We were 200. We were about a 2,000 square foot gym. Now, there was Brick, New York. There was Reebok, CrossFit, Fifth Avenue. That were very large gyms that had well over 600 members. We had just under 300 members. We showed up with the most people. Second to CrossFit. NYC, which has over 1,500 members. Wow. But we showed up with 90 people. 
90, where Brick and Reebok showed up with maybe 40. And so what it took to build that was literally caring, just caring about the people. It was absolute focus on service. It was bringing all the things that I learned in corporate fitness, which are fantastic about service and, and customer service, but then adding in my own spin of actually caring about the person, taking it a step further, messaging them when I didn't see them in the gym, uh, building bonds between them. You know you're successful when the members are doing things on their own, when they're building their own book clubs, when they're hanging out and supporting each other. And it started with literally the first happy hour and it built all the way to that. Well, one of the things I want to, I want to make sure that's emphasized for listeners that you just said in that same thing is the three member, two members or three members and then 10 and then little by little, it, it was a brick by brick, brick by brick process of building that foundation and that community. It wasn't just like, Hey, our first event, we had hundreds of people immediately show up. It was a great, you know, massive success in terms of numbers, but it was something that over time developed where today it's really easy to get caught up on social media of seeing someone with a certain amount of followers or a certain amount, of, you think you know what their business looks like. And yet they started little piece by piece by piece. It's just, you're just now coming into the picture at this stage. Um, that's, that's awesome to hear. And, and obviously incredibly encouraging because community is what I believe makes uh, that space and sport and, and just style of life uh, so unique because there's millions of ways to get fit but the groups that are continuing to stick their neck out and build a lasting community, whether that's CrossFit, whether that's Orange Theory, Camp Gladiator, you name it, are the ones that are continuing to endure because you've got people that hold you accountable, encourage you, and it's a place you want to be a part of. So after leaving there, what eventually brought you here to Texas? So leaving there, I left to Kuwait, and I took a position all the way in the Middle East. Uh, and the reason being is, you know, what we talked about a little bit earlier when I know what you want to get to is, you know, the doubt and the stuff that I had in my brain. I didn't own that gym. I didn't own it. And I was never going to own it. And the owners made sure for me to know that, that I was never going to own it. And they made sure to treat me like that as well. So in the end, after everything that I did, uh, and all the hard work that I did and, and the countless hours that I opened the gym and I closed the gym and we opened up a second gym. I knew that if I wanted to keep my self-respect and if I wanted to keep my sanity, <laughs> so to speak, it was time for me to move on. As much as I love those members, as much as I treated that gym like my own, it just was never going to be mine. And I had a decision. I can either go and open up my own or I can just leave. And I was faced with that, but I always wanted to travel. I always wanted to travel. I always wanted to see the world. I've never traveled. You know, I'm just like a typical American. I maybe went to Mexico. I maybe went to Puerto Rico or to the other side of the country, but that was my, that was as far as I traveled. So I had a non-compete anyways, which doesn't hold up water anyways, but I decided to say, you know what, I'm going to take a year and I'm going to travel. And I had the opportunity to take a position with a company that was looking to grow and build their brand out in Kuwait. And I had the opportunity to go out there and do so. And then they offered me great perks to travel. So I decided to take that opportunity. And that's what, that was my next step uh, after uh, leaving New York. Which was a, a very big step and obviously <laughs> is still obviously active in, in certain things that, that you're doing uh, and really the name that's known for uh, the fitness event over there. How did you get into event play, play by play announcing? Uh, you obviously have a big personality and big voice, but w what led you into that path? <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, so being a personal trainer in New York City, with no social media at that time, you have to do things to become, or you had to do things to be known. And so I did every event. I marketed myself. I remember going to GN, local GNCs and putting up a table and putting out my business cards. I remember working many, many different events. I remember working, um, volunteering 
for like these like massive health fairs in the city and doing these boot camps in Central Park and doing that stuff, which ultimately led to me being comfortable in events. So when CrossFit came down, I decided to uh, submerge myself. I did every competition I could because I realized very quickly I wasn't going to be an athlete. Well, I wasn't going to be successful as a high-level athlete at that point. So I decided to jump in on the other side. And uh, I, I did every judging role you can imagine. I volunteered. I worked with vendors. I did it all. But I was always scared to get on the microphone. I hated uh, the way my voice sounded went through the speaker. I hated hearing it on a recording uh, because of my New York accent. You know, I always resonate. I always thought a person with the accent was looked at as sort of uh, not smart or uneducated, so to speak. So I was always a little very self-conscious about that. However, uh, it was during an open, uh, we had an open uh, celebration, like we, uh, we did the open and we had a DJ and the DJ gives me the microphone. He's like, all right, go. And this is in Kuwait now. And I'm like, okay. And I just got on the mic and I literally emceed the event and sure enough, that just gave me the confidence to say, man, dude, this is where you really need to be going. This is what you need to be doing. And I fell in love with it. And it was, it was so awesome. And so I, start, I, I begged to MC the Battle of the East, which was the first, which was the, really the largest event out there at the time in Kuwait. This was before the Dubai Fitness Championships was really big. They were, the company I worked with, they wanted to b- bring CrossFit out there. And so Diego Centino, who's, at, who's in Dubai now, uh, and he, he brought me to Dubai, he was like, no, I need you to run the event. I need you to, like, you're, you know, you're programming it. I need you to support the team. I need you to help, you know, to run the event. And I'm like, dude, I really want to MC. <laughs> and he's like, no, we got other MCs, man. You're going to run it. And I'm like, no, brother, I really want to MC. So finally he gave in. Luckily enough, he, he gave in and he said, okay, you can MC as long as the guys, you know, are, as long as everything is done on your end. And I'm like, fine. And luckily we had a couple of guys that are phenomenal who I continue to work with now running the event. And so that first event was it. The Battle of the East. Uh, I forgot, God, it was 2014, maybe 2014, 2014, yep. 2015, 2014. And that was it. And be- because of that, I was able to build a, uh, a relationships across overseas uh, and do it with people that were doing events overseas. And I, f- I flew out to London. I did uh, the, the athlete games, which was a big deal out there. Uh, I went back a couple of times, did the Battle of the East. And working with Power Steering, the company Power Steering, with uh, my good buddy Max uh, from Germany, he brought me to Germany and he, every event that he does, he's like, I want you to bring this MC out there. And because of him and because of Diego and like my relationships, uh, I've been able to build a, a great, uh, a great experience going overseas and doing MC. That's awesome. And so let me ask you on that note, how many languages yeah. beyond English do you speak? Just one. <laughs> just new york that's it there you go that's so it. I, I love that because somebody listening might be thinking well how you know this guy's got it all he probably speaks all these different languages he can go mc in these other countries the man speaks english only and he is known overseas as the mc at these fitness events uh i love it man so now we want to switch gears a little bit before we dive into the move to texas i want to take a, a little bit of a turn for those listening, there's a big reason I wanted James in the show because a lot of the things James has dealt with and overcome, you might not necessarily know if you're just kind of watching from afar, you've seen him at some of these fitness events and things like that. But the guy uh, has grit uh, because he continues to even situations he's put himself in, he's found himself in, he continues to overcome. And so one of the things that really initiated it, me wanting you on the podcast was a post you put out about two months ago uh, or three months ago now, since this is January uh, about the idea that you had, you know, gone from on the exterior looking like financial success. And on the inside, you were, you were struggling at home. You were struggling paying bills. You were struggling with a Metro card. There was such a diverse look from the exterior versus what was actually going on. And so I want to talk a little bit about, how 
in a tough time like that, when a lot of people probably looked at you and thought you were just this crazy success story and everything was going well, but on the interior, you were dealing with the stresses and obviously financial burdens and weight. How were you able to one, maintain the right attitude to continue pressing forward? And, and two, what was the turning point to stop eventually self-sabotaging yourself or putting yourself in certain situations as, as you said? It started with my beliefs. Um, we have narratives and we play these narratives over and over and over in our heads. Now, for me personally, I've always had, because of my parents and because of watching their work ethic, I've always had uh, a tremendous work ethic, thankfully because of my parents. And I've always had a tremendous amount of pride because of them. However, we're always going to get right back to the point in our life where we think we deserve. And I always told myself, this is exactly what you deserve. This is it. Because I held on to so many guilt in my life for so many mistakes. And because of those mistakes, I would never actually learn from them. What I would do is hold them. And I would hold them as guilt. And I would hold them like baggage, so to speak. So instead of me pushing forward in my life and, and what I said, remember earlier, instead of honestly taking that moment and going and open up my own gym, which many people told me I should do because I had the opportunity to do it, I wouldn't have took a year to explore. Now, yes, that was a fantastic, that was fantastic for me to do. But the reason why I really didn't open the gym was because I didn't believe I could make it happen. Because I had already had failures previously in two other businesses uh, that didn't happen very well. So I told myself, I'm not, uh, you know what, let me take a year off. When I come back, I'll do it. I'll come back, I'll do it. I always put things off. I was always the biggest procrastinator because of the stories that I would tell myself. And financially, I had a bad relationship with money. You know, I just, we grew up, we didn't really have a lot. My dad uh, my dad worked his ass off, but you know, we were, you know, we, we grew up in, in a blue collar neighborhood in Brooklyn, you know, and we weren't very, very well off. So I never had a great relationship with money. And you know, if you ever read the, the, the book, reach dad, poor dad, you realize why you realize why. So through a lot of internal looking and making sure that I had to do the right things for myself and figure out why I was in the position that I was in and why I kept coming back to the same old struggles. It was really looking inward and I had to look, take a deep look at myself and realize who actually was stopping me. It wasn't the previous owners. It wasn't the investors that were not giving me the money. It wasn't the people that weren't uh, thinking about coming on as members. It wasn't anyone else other than me. It was me that was stopping myself. And I had to really finally take a good look at that person and come to terms with them and understand how to deal with them. What, what kind of was that process like for you? So if someone's listening to this and might something you're saying, sparking something in them in terms of them starting to realize, Oh, maybe this is why this keeps happening to me. I keep putting myself in these certain situations. What did just a little bit of your own, coming to terms process look like or did you work with someone because obviously that's not an overnight switch and so it's yeah. something that takes time to develop what, what were some things that were helpful for you during that you know luckily this day and age there's so much information and great content out there right we have some of the brilliant most greatest minds uh right at the touch of a fingertip and you know you have people like yourself uh that are putting out such great content out there so i started to consume it versus consuming the negative con you know versus I, I started to put the netflix away and i started to grab the books i started to just submerse myself into just taking little bits and pieces uh there was like these youtube uh videos that i used to love that it had like eric thomas and les miles and i would play that right before i would work out and i would get super inspired and before i know it i would go deep down the rabbit hole on youtube and i'd find this speaker and i'd find that speaker and it would resonate with me. And I'm like, man, that is exactly what I'm dealing with. So I started to dive into these people and I found so many good resources out there. And I started to take a lot of the tips that they told me to do. 
Uh, and one was clarity, you know, finding clarity. Tony Robbins says it often, you know, clarity is power. So it's like, okay, well, how do I get that? How do I, how do I get that? Right. And I started to take the steps. Do you journal? Do you sit down for five minutes and just journal? And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't journal. You know, I always told people it's great to journal, but I didn't do it. Right. So I said, let me do this. Let me get it. I had, I had so many books, Jake. I literally had 10 books of journals. Never, I never touched. Right. Or they were just like scribbles in them that I would start. So I was like, I'm going to take this book and this is the book I'm going to start with. And I started to do all the little things that were given to me as tips. And I started with um, Jim Quick. Uh, if you can, Jim Quick's phenomenal, right? And I knew in order for me to be successful, I needed to start thinking better, right? I just didn't feel like my brain was really moving in the right direction. So I started, okay, how can I think better? And it was started with like, okay, just wake up in the morning and write three things that you're grateful for. Okay, I can do that. And it started with that. And then reading Jim, uh, listening to Jim Quick, I was put on to Tom Bilyeu. And um, I started consuming Tom Bilyeu. And through Tom Bilyeu, I find Ed Milet. And through Ed Milet, Ed Milet's like, okay, do your morning routine. I want you to take these uh, seven questions and ask yourself these seven questions. And at night, I want you to ask yourself these three questions. So I started to really like, okay, I can take Ed stuff. And I started to really dive into what Ed offered. And lo and behold, I'm doing the basics. I'm doing the basics. I'm journaling. I'm drinking more water. I'm instead of uh, focusing on aesthetics and performance in the gym, I'm just focusing on my health with the eating, right? When it comes to like, not just watching my macros, I'm actually, I started investing in real food in like real food, like really good food, quality food. So I'm starting to take the necessary steps and I get to a point where I'm like, wow, I feel really good. And I have the clarity and I have the vision that I want. I think it's time to get a coach. And I decided to make a transition in my career. And I knew I couldn't do it alone. And I missed, like I said earlier, I missed being a student. I missed learning, right? I, that's why I joined that CrossFit gym the first time. And I joined CrossFit Garden City was I loved learning. I loved just immersing myself into it and just not having the answers. So I went and I hired a coach and I hired a friend of mine that I worked with 10 years ago who had made a very similar transition. He was a self-defense coach. He was a, an investor in a couple of different businesses that didn't pan out. So he had a lot of, I knew he had the type of spirit that I, I, I had to persevere through these things that didn't work out in his life, but he was able to turn it and do exactly what he wanted to do. So we talked and I decided to hire him and it has been a complete game changer for me. Dude, I love that. I love that. And, and I love just similar to how you built your community I, with the gym. It was done a day at a time, one action at a time, small action of three journalings in the morning. You're building on that. You're building on that until it becomes so second nature for you that it's just part of who you are. Um, James Clear, who I've mentioned a few times on the show, have you read Atomic Habits? I have not. Okay, so he in the writing book, that down, right, dude? Atomic came habits. out came out uh, quarter four last year, twenty eighteen, um, but it talks about some of these subtle things that we do, and how they reinforce our behavior. So, like taking and creating new habits are done really small, easy steps. Write one thing down, read one page a day, and you build off of that time by time, and. and it reinforces, even if it's the day you have a bad workout, you're not as worried about physique, you're worried about health. And in his point, he said, if you go into the gym and have a bad workout, a bad workout is still a good workout because you're building on what you've done previously. And even if it's just terrible, it's 20 minutes instead of the hour you planned, you're reinforcing the fact that you are a person that works out, lives an active, healthy lifestyle versus skipping. So hearing you tell that from your personal journey and perspective is huge for our listeners just to understand the importance of starting small and just building on every, every single day. One of the other things I wanted to, to dive into that I just love hearing lessons and things people, if, if you were looking back on your 20 year old self before yeah. your journey started into CrossFit, you know, what are some things you would share? And I, and I know you recently made your post about turning 40 and some yeah. of the biggest lessons you had from that one, I'm curious what inspired you to share 
those lessons with everyone. Uh, and two, if you, do you remember what the, the five are? I've got them written down here in front of me and would love for our listeners to, to hear that because a lot of our listeners right now are in their twenties and thirties. Right. So they're not quite to that stage yet. So they're still a little bit behind you on the journey and any of that, uh, man, you've been through a roller coaster. You've dealt with debt. You've had the successes of opening and building great communities. You've moved overseas because you had an opportunity, but you, invo- you avoided your own opportunity uh, to now embracing that life, those mistakes, that building it into what it is today. Um, I'd love for you just to share a little bit of your life lessons uh, as encouragement also, but it was a way to, to point some of these listeners into the, some things that you've learned on your journey that they can start to look out for. Yeah. Okay. That's, I love that. I love that. Let's see. I actually have them here. I do have them here. I figured you had them written down too. somewhere. Yeah. You know, and that's, I, you know, that's part of the process is writing these things down. So that's a, that's another lesson for everyone. Uh, The first thing that I learned was if I could go back and tell my 20 year old self and why it was so important for me to share this was I'm a father and I have a 19 year old daughter who doesn't listen. (laughs) <laughs> like many 19 year olds and she you know obviously she doesn't think she thinks her dad's some boring guy right or you know he's, he's whatever he's a know-it-all she always tells me don't treat me like your clients <laughs> but I know she listens I know she listens so it inspired me because uh, do, you, do you know who Bejo's Koulian is yep okay so I listened to a podcast of him and he part of one of his um his uh, therapy, he went to therapy and one of the things that he had to do with therapy was write a letter to the little boy that he was, that, that was abused. And he writes this letter to this little boy each and every day. And through that, he was able to put down a lot of trauma and a lot of pain. So I was like, wow, that is a phenomenal, phenomenal way to get back in touch with my 20 year old self. So I started to think about writing these lessons not only to my daughter, but to me as a 20 year old or to a 15 year old. And one of the things that I remember as a 20 year old, and if I could say it, it's one of the first things is stop trading my time for money. Uh, And, you know, I learned that the rich buy time and the poor sell it. And I've had such a crappy relationship with money uh, for all the wrong reasons. However, uh, it, the, one of the first lessons I wanted to tell myself as a 20 year old was, Hey, don't trade your time for money, you know, uh, learn how to deal with it and learn how to deal with money uh, the best way that you can. I want to, um, I, I want to make a note on that because yeah. that's a very common struggle for a lot of people in the health and wellness space, especially on the corporate training side, because it's that one-on-one client is what you're living and depending on. And, and you're essentially, you're maxed out at a certain time and all you're doing is trading that time for that money. Yes. Now there's going to be a time in your life that it's a necessary evil, right? There's going to be those times in your life where you're going to have to work. And during that work time, you're learning, right? You're building who you are. So yeah, you're going to have to do that, but don't settle that that's going to be it for the rest of your life. So that's one thing I will temper is there's going to be a time you will have to do that, but in the long run, understand how to develop your skill sets so that you can trade uh, results for money versus trading your time. Uh, the, sec- the second thing is the world needs you. The world doesn't need me to become Jake and start talking like Jake and start using a lot. I can now be influenced by Jake. Absolutely. But the world needs me. It needed me. And why I learned that was because so many people, when I would put a podcast, when I put a post out there, would write me back. And they would be like, man, that that was amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Oh my God. Thank you for for sharing your thoughts. Uh, Members in the gym would always thank me for uh, calling them out when I needed to call them out, right? And and being me, so to speak. So I learned to, the world doesn't need a carbon copy of yourself, it needs you. It needs your voice and it needs you to find it. Uh, So that's my second lesson. Um, And part of that second lesson is, your voice needs to become from the the best version of yourself each and every day. So that's your job. Don't try to be someone else, 
become the best version of yourself each and every day and use that voice as much as you can. Um, do it for the purpose and not the applause. And this is huge, especially for people in the fitness industry. It's real easy to buy into the hype. People are going to tell you, they love you. Oh my God, I love your class. James, you were fantastic. That was such a great show. Oh my God, we loved it. It's real easy to buy into that hype. It really is. However, at the end of the day, it's, it's going to go away. It's going to fade out. And what are you going to be left with? So do it for the purpose, not the applause. Uh, and that's huge because all too many, especially influencers and fitness people, they can't wait to make an announcement, right? It's always like, I'm proud to announce X, Y, and Z, right? I'm proud to announce this. It's like, no one cares. No one cares. Just go to work the next day. I know you got a new job. Fantastic. Go to work. However, do it for the purpose. What is the purpose? Why are you doing this? And do it for that reason. Let the applause come, right? Be, you know, be appreciative of the applause. Be super gracious for it, but don't do it for the applause. Do it for the purpose. Uh, so that third reason, I love that you got me bringing these out, but I got to look at the phone. Uh, and this is huge. This was huge for me personally, and I had to learn this as an idea guy, right? Schedule it. If you want to accomplish something, put a date on it. And that is so huge. If you want to, if you have a vision, if you have a goal, fantastic, right? But put a date on it. Okay, I, and make it very, very clear. I want, don't just say, I want to be fit. What does that look like? What does that feel like, right? What does fit feel like? First off, I hate the term fit. I don't think it, it, it's so vanilla, right? I want to get stronger. Okay, fantastic. How, how are we going to get strong, right? I want to, I want to be healthier. Okay, let's, let's break that down. I want, to, I want to start a business. Okay, great. You want to start a business. What is that business? Put a date on it. Put a date, and that date is going to start to help you to move the needle forward. Yep. So that's my number four, and... I'm looking for number five. Got to get the face ID up first. Hold on. It's okay. And number five is because I have a huge background in health and fitness is never take your fitness, never take your health, I should say, or your youth for granted. Uh, it's your body. It's your responsibility. And this goes for a lot of CrossFitters and a lot of people in the functional fitness space, strength athletes, weightlifters, competitive athletes in general. Don't take your health for granted. Don't trade your fitness for your health because I did that. I did that. I literally worked out for three hours a day. I ate donuts after squatting small off, right? Because I needed to get big, right? I, and I bulked. And then because I was bulking, I would eat burgers. And then when I wanted to cut and I needed to lose weight, I would go on my macros, but then I wouldn't be eating enough calories. That's not healthy. And I can tell you all of those reps that I did poorly, all of those reps that I shouldn't have done, all of that bad eating will haunt you in 10 years. You'll feel them. I feel every rep that I did in my 20s. I feel every rep that I did in my 30s. I feel every bad donut that I ate. And not to feel guilty, go eat donuts. I love I know you love your donuts. Uh, every day. Right? But what I'm <laughs> saying is don't trade your health for your fitness. Uh, excuse me, don't trade your, right? And don't take your youth for granted because at the end of the day, it's coming. I remember being 25. I remember, you know, being, you know, young and, and running miles with no problem and waking up and partying one night and getting right back into the gym the next day. That doesn't happen anymore. No, it does. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> so that, those would be my five rules. Uh, if I can break them down. And, and that last one is, is, is really big. And I told people to read that and repeat it. You know, uh, don't take your health and your, and your youth for granted. Uh, you got it one time in your life, take full responsibility for it. Dude, that's, that's huge. Especially, you know, the audience that's here and part of compete, they're active, you know, the, some CrossFit, yeah. some run obstacle course, but it's very easy to get the competitive side built up to where you're worrying about what everyone else is doing and you're doing things to your body and your training that because you're trying to be like someone else instead of trying to be better than who you were the day before and focusing on how do I build a better life for myself versus taking shortcuts to 
get an edge on someone for an upcoming race or competition or whatever. So that message can't be stressed enough, buddy. So it's 2019. I've got to hear what, what's on the docket for you this year. What are you excited about? What are some things online as we start to follow you as people listening, this start tuning into more of this positive stuff you're putting out. What do you got going on this year? So I'm excited. There's a lot of different things. I'm taking a back, uh, 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 moving forward and evolving my coaching career. After 16 years of coaching fitness and coaching trainers and mentoring trainers and mentoring uh, countless people and corporate fitness, one of the things that I realized was I was just having conversations about life, right? Like, what are the things that are helping people to be successful in the gym? I would just have conversations. Hey, you need to sleep better. Hey, you need a journal. Hey, you need to eat better. Hey, you need to do all of these things. But I was a Band-Aid, right? There would be, we would push that stuff to the side and then go work out. And then just, you know, forget what they needed to forget to for an hour and then get back to their life and be back to being miserable or just unproductive. Well, I started to realize as the kind of person that I was, that I was having conversations outside of the gym about non-fitness things, about things to help them with their anxieties, about things that were helping them to focus better, about uh, how to deal with um, dysfunction in relationships. And this has been a big part of my career. And, but they were just conversations. But they were so helpful and people were so grateful for them. And I started to realize this is the stuff. This is it. This is where, sure, barbells and push-ups are going to help people. But if I really want this person to be successful, period, this is the stuff that's got to come first. This is where the work is now. And so I've been diving into that over the last six months. And that's why I decided to hire a coach was I wanted to go through the process myself of going through personal development, personal and professional development, life strategy, and how to be productive and how to really create your legacy. You know, it's not just motivation. It's not just inspiration hoopla. There are absolutely steps that you can do each and every day so that you can wake up and you can be successful and productive. So I decided to evolve my coaching career into that, uh, into that area. Uh, I'm looking to kind of, take a page out of your book and do more speaking. You've inspired me to do that. I love that you've done that brother. And, Thank uh, you. You need I to. I, me- I messaged you a couple of months back and I was like, dude, let me know when you're speaking. Cause I just can't wait to see it. I'm uh, moving into the speaking, uh, but the coaching's first and the podcast is second. The podcast has been something that I've been wanting to start for a very long time. And that will come out in uh, first week of February. Love it. I love it. So right after we'll be airing this, uh, yours is going to go live. Dude, that's a very exciting step forward for you. I'm, I'm excited about what's on the horizon for you as well as the, the people you're going to be impacting with that. And hopefully somebody listening to this show that's just immediately connected with the message or it's resonated well with them uh, can reach out. So on that note, how can people get connected with you? What's the best way to find you, connect with you, say hi? If you're on social media, look for me on Instagram. Life is James Quigley, Facebook. You can uh, find me on James Quigley. Or you can just shoot me an email, uh, jamesqfitness.com. And the website will be up in January, and the podcast will be running up in February. I love it. I love it, my man. Thank you so much for coming on today's show. Brother, it is an absolute honor and absolute pleasure to be on here. I've always loved your message. I've always loved the brand. uh, And I've seen it from afar. We've wanted to have this conversation for two years, and I'm glad we were finally able to do it. 